Thank you, Professor Shamir, for that real interesting and uh, stimulating presentation. Uh, we are left with 15 minutes for Q&A discussion. Uh, I know that, uh, uh, especially after those brilliant presentations, one should come up with a lot of queries, uh, uh, questions, and uh, uh, let me open the floor now for this discussion, but please uh, be brief in your comments and questions, uh, as we would like to have as many as we can. Please, will you please introduce yourself? Thanks, I'm Karen Wayne from Australia. Just to have a question, thank you, wonderful presentations. Professor Rabinovich, I would be interested to know what you think the US would be best doing at this stage in Syria with respect to its own interests and with respect to Israel's interests. Why won't we actually collect some? Please, yes. Um, yeah, please. Sorry, uh, Bill Shaw from London. There's a question for Shimon Shamir. I'd like to know a little bit more about the opposition in Egypt and how the Salafi uh, fit into that as part of that uh, opposition. And one more for that round. Please, sir, yeah. Bob Brain in London. Um, Hamas is obviously the biggest loser um, with both Professor Shamir and... Professor Rabinovich, also from the point of view of uh, Hezbollah now siding with the Syrian regime, that presumably has affected Hamas, and is that why there are less rockets now into Israel from Gaza? Okay. Briefly, what the, what the United States, I think, needs to do is uh, to start working with the opposition. <clears throat> the, uh, the common phrase in, uh, in America is not to have boots on the ground in, in Syria. My uh, suggestion to America is to have sneakers on the ground, to use, to use the CIA, to use special forces, to start working with, them, with the more moderate militias, not with the Islamists, not with the jihadis, um, to invest in, uh, in tomorrow morning, to, to have on the ground moderate, or relatively moderate pro-Western pro uh, militias. Secondly, uh, to establish no-fly zones, uh, uh, to, to provide the opposition with uh, uh, carefully selected weapons that will enable them to deal with the Syrian Air Force and armor and to tilt, uh, uh, tilt the balance. Uh, not so much because I would like to see the, necessarily the opposition defeat the regime, because I'm concerned that the victory of the Russian-Iranian Hezbollah coalition in Syria is going to spell very negative news for Israel. Uh, the opposition uh, in Egypt, it consists of a variety of parties and movements uh, who have different orientation. This is their weakness, and this is one of the reasons why they were defeated in the elections. But they are getting organized. For the first time, they have now an umbrella organization. It's called the uh, National Salvation Front, led by Amr Musa, whom you may remember from his years in the United Nations in the Arab League. Um, and they operate quite effectively. Um, there is a new opposition trend which emerged last month. This is something entirely new. Um, a, a, a new movement spontaneously emerged. They call themselves Tamarud. Tamarud means rebellion. And they organized a petition in Egypt calling for the uh, resignation of Morsi, um, very bluntly. The opposition sometimes cannot be that blunt. But they say in their uh, petition, Morsi must go. And within a very short time, within a few days, they managed to gather a million votes, million signatures uh, on this uh, petition. So the uh, opposition is uh, quite, uh, quite effective in their methods. Uh, and. Uh, 
they endanger, I would say, they endanger the continuation of uh, the control of the country by the Islamic Brotherhood. Uh, I, I remember the time when um, people were asking uh, the American leadership, uh, I'm phrasing it very cautiously, why is it that they support the Islamic Brotherhood, which is essentially so anti-Western and so dangerous for all the interests of uh, the West in this region? And the answer given was, we must go along with the history. Now, this was quite an arrogant statement because who knows where history is leading? And the way it looks like, it's absolutely not certain that Islamism will persist. Thank you. Yeah. One thing I'd like to add about the Hamas. The Hamas is very much deterred after these uh, caste-led operations, but it's not just uh, Hamas vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Hamas has two other major vectors against it. Uh, Hamas leader, Mashal, used to sit in Damascus, a Sunni. Uh, once the upheaval in, uh, in Syria started, there was a real, a real division between Sunnis and Shiites, and uh, Hamas had to take a stand against Syria, so it was cut off uh, from support, financial support from Syria, Iran, and also military. Also, uh, the relations between Hamas and the and Morsi regime uh, is not very good either. So Hamas now is in a very, very precarious position. And they know if they do start a front against Israel, they will not get the backing, not of Syria or Iran, not of Egypt, and it can danger their own um, control and, and governance uh, over Gaza. So this is, I think, these three factors, deterrence by Israel, and not having the back of Iran, Syria, and not in Egypt, this is what makes them quiet for now. Thank you. We have time for another round, please. One, two, three. Sorry. And Guillermo, you would be the fourth. Thank you. My name is Peter Stein from Sweden, and I would like to ask any one of the panelists who would like to reply. How might the uh, recent upheavals in Turkey affect Turkish foreign policy? Mm -hmm. Okay. Please. Here. Okay. Evening, Royal Australia. I just have to hear something about Jordan. It's one Jordan. country you haven't spoken about. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Alex Gartner, Vienna. I remember in the, around the year 2000, the main topic in this symposium was terrorism within Israel and suicide attacks. We don't talk about this anymore. Has this, been, uh, uh, go, has this gone or will it come back or do we don't need to worry about it anymore? <laughs> and uh, this is Guillermo here. I'd like to make a reference to uh, apparent conceptual differences between the U.S. government and the Israeli uh, government now that they're about uh, to, now that the um, Secretary of State Kerry is about to come back here and try to negotiate again between both parties, that is to say, Israel and the Palestinians. On the one hand, we have um, uh, Secretary Kerry saying this is a window of opportunity to jumpstart the negotiations again. Uh, and Israel is saying perhaps, you know, uh, the situation is too fragile. Uh, we don't know, we're not sure whether the government is sufficiently uh, strong to enter into serious negotiations. Furthermore, uh, the Palestinians still uh, insist on a non-recognition of Israel as a Jewish state. Uh, they do uh, still talk about a pullback to the 67 borders, including the division of Jerusalem and the law of return. On the other hand, Kerry, uh, who is pushing very hard for Israel to engage in these negotiations uh, and wants the Palestinians to also uh, be active in them, tries to so-called bribe them, if you wish, with uh, about $4 billion in aid, but the Palestinians are not impressed. 
Finally, there seem to be also conceptual differences when it comes to crossing certain red lines vis-a-vis -vis Iran's nuclear program, uh, as seen from the perspective from Israel and the United States. So the question becomes, how serious are these conceptual differences that separate both countries, and what will be the implications? Thank you. Itamar, would you like to start? Yes. Yeah, we uh, quietly uh, di distributed the, the work, so uh, let, me, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, let me respond with regard to Turkey and to, to Secretary Kerry. Uh, Turkey, uh, Turkey emerged in, in the past decade as a major uh, actor in, in the Middle East. It used, of course, for four centuries uh, as the Ottoman Empire to dominate the whole region, and its absence from the region <clears throat> in the 20th century was an important fact. Uh, now being rebuffed by the European Union, it came back to the Middle East and, and began to act as a, as a major regional power. This power, it turned out, had feet of clay. Uh, Turkey itself is not as coherently put together as it, it would like to think, with a large Kurdish major, a minority, with a large minority called Alevis, that are not to be confused with the Syrian Alawites, but are close to them. It's a Shiite minority in, in Turkey. And it turned out that in, in conducting his Syrian policy, Erdogan met with domestic difficulties. And now, of course, he has domestic difficulties of, of another order, and I think that Turkey's quest for a leadership, a hegemonial <coughs> role in the Middle East uh, <coughs> is, going to be, is going to be affected <coughs> by, by these domestic uh, vulnerabilities. Now, with regard to U.S. policy in the Middle East, you may have heard the news, let's begin with Israel. The Deputy Defense Minister, Mr. Danny, one Danny Danone, is, is the most eloquent member of the cabinet, uh, and uh, he speaks, he says something almost every day. Yesterday he announced that uh, he does not support the policy of the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister says that he is for a two-state solution, Mr. Danone is not. Unfortunately, this is not so funny, because Mr. Dan <laughs> Mr. Danone also rep represents the fact that the Prime Minister does not control his own party. This is a, an important fact of uh, Israeli political life, and uh, I don't know that Prime Minister Netanyahu will have the strength that Prime Minister Sharon had at the time to leave the Likud and create another party and, and, and implement the policy he believed in. But uh, it, it means that the ability of this government to, to carry out policy and diplomacy is going to be affected. Unfortunately, something not quite the same, but similar is happening in America. It is not at all sure that Secretary Kerry has the full backing of his president. He's very active in Syria, he's very active in the Israeli-Palestinian front, but we don't see that the president is that, is that interested. And many people ask, ask themselves in the Middle East, does Secretary Kerry have with him the authority of, of the president? Secretaries of State and national security advisors for the United States who have been successful here, Kissinger, Baker, and so forth, were to a great extent successful because it was known that they carry the presidential authority with them. This is not at all certain with regard to Secretary Kerry. A word about Jordan. Well, once again, uh, when the uh, Arab Spring exploded, it was feared that uh, this is the end of the Hashemite uh, monarchy in Jordan, and with its collapse, uh, also Jordanian-Israeli peace uh, will uh, disappear. It didn't happen. You know, the Jordanian regime, the, the Hashemite regime, was mourned so many times from the beginning of the 50s. People very often said, that this is a regime that has no future. But it turned out that, as it is sometimes uh, formulated, it is the most uh, stable, unstable regime in the Middle East. And this is what happened again. Um, the regime survived. 
Uh, there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, the king enjoys a kind of legitimacy that does not exist in other countries. He's a descendant of the prophet. He also maneuvered quite well the opposition. He had to play between reform and maintenance of the power uh, of the present system. Uh, and he managed to do it. There were recently elections in Jordan. Uh, the um, opposition unwittingly boycotted it as a result of, the fact, as a result of this fact. Uh, 150, uh, 150 delegates, uh, uh, deputies in parliament uh, are not really opposition uh, to the regime. Everybody feared the Palestinians. They are a majority. Uh, they are against Israel. Uh, they are not very happy with this regime. What would be their position? Well, it turned out that they did not want to rock the boat. Private sector is in the hands of the Palestinians. And they are looking around them. They see the situation in Syria. They see the situation in Egypt. Uh, these situations are bad for business. And we hardly hear the voice of the Palestinians in this situation. The one question relating to the suicide attacks. I, I would say there are two reasons why we do not uh, witness this uh, brutal suicide attacks anymore. One is an effective Israeli answer, the fence. Uh, the fence which was called by the Palestinians an apartheid fence, uh, uh, forgetting that it took us you know, only 35 years. 35 years we did not have a fence on our eastern uh, front. It was just as a response to this uh, brutal suicide attacks. Anyway, the fence is very effective just as it is around the, the, the Gaza Strip. So this is one thing. Of course, it's uh, not just a fence, it's also detections, intelligence, prevention. Uh, secondly, they have found an, uh, an easier way, uh, the terrorist, which is an indirect uh, uh, fire of these rockets. Uh, it takes uh, less uh, planning and less uh, uh, resources, and they are very much trying to get the same uh, technology of building the Qassam rockets and launchers that they have in Gaza to bring it over into the West Bank. And this is one of the, I would say, um, the, the, the number on our, on our priority uh, agenda. This is the first uh, military or security forces agenda to prevent this technology transfer of launching rockets from Gaza into uh, into uh, the West Bank, but always we have to prepare, I guess, they, they always say about the generals how they prepared for the last uh, uh, war and not the, the next one. I guess the suicide bombing is something um, of the past, not that it will not return, and we have to be now more geared against incoming missiles from far, whether it's the, the Grads or whether it's the Scuds in Syria uh, or in uh, the, the, the Shihabs in, in Iran, or the, the very uh, close range of, of the Qassam and Katyusha rockets around us. This is why we have this Iron Dome, and we invest a lot in, uh, in missile defense. Uh, last thing about uh, Mr. Danone, I think it was Kissinger who said, all politics is local. And I was thinking, what uh, has made him come up with this such a uh, defiance to his prime minister? And then I remembered. At the end of this month, there is elections to be the president of the Central Committee of Likud, and Danone is uh, one of the candidates. So, go figure. Okay, uh, um, I think that uh, this was really a lovely and very, very, uh, I think, fascinating discussion here because we tried actually to uh, come up with some new insights about the Middle East. Uh, and I think that our presenters uh, provided us with that. But this is actually just to open up your appetite. We invite you to browse the internet of the Moshe Dayan Center if you would like to have some more stuff about that. Newsletters, uh, uh, publications, we are coming up with a lot of uh, uh, food for thought, a lot of stuff about this ever-changing region. So you are more than welcome to browse the internet and uh, just be uh, part of our list. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, would you please just help me out in thanking once again our distinguished guest.
Thank you. We wish you an enjoyable stay in Tel Aviv and Israel. Bye. Okay.